<clears throat> Please take your Bibles and turn with me back to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we'll be continuing uh, through the Gospel of Matthew as we began last week and looking at the genealogy of Jesus. And now we will begin reading in verse number 18 and we'll read to verse number 25. Matthew 1, verse number 18. Listen to this. This is the Word of God. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken, through the, spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. O oh Lord, once again we have come to worship you. We have come to look into the scriptures, the gospel of Matthew. One of the four gospels that you gave us that gives us an account of the ministry of your Son and His coming into this world and what He came to do for us. Open our eyes and ears, our hearts, this evening. Minister to us in ways that we don't even realize that we need, Father. And strengthen us in our faith in all of these things as we continue to learn more and, remem and be reminded of, of things about our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for looking upon us with mercy for His sake. And we ask that you would forgive us of our shortcomings, our sins, our negligences, our ignorances, and look upon us for the sake of your Son. And it is in His name we pray. Amen. So after uh, He gives the, us the genealogy, Matthew proceeds to give us an account of how the Son of God was born. He begins with telling us that Mary and Joseph were not yet married. They were betrothed. And many times people equate this with our modern understanding of engagement. But in ancient Israel, betrothal was more than what we would understand to be as engagement. It was a step into the marriage process. One might could even say that because they were betrothed, they were partially husband and wife. To the Jews, though the marriage had not yet been consummated, the betrothal of Mary and Joseph was legal, and it was binding, and any case of immorality that occurred during uh, that time could be treated as a case of adultery, with the guilty party facing harsh penalties, or possibly even death. And it was during this betrothal period that Joseph begins to notice that Mary is with child. 
Now, the Scripture says that she was with child of the Holy Ghost. However, Joseph did not know this at first. His first reaction was no doubt that Mary had, had been with another man. For it says, before they came together, she was found with child. And so Joseph is now in the midst of a great dilemma. He could stay with Mary and pretend that the child is his, and, uh, but then he would have to face accusations toward himself of fornication since the marriage was not fully in, in effect. They were only in their betrothal period. Another option he had uh, was uh, uh, that he could expose Mary as the fornicator before the people and maintain a blameless reputation for himself, putting her to shame. But Joseph does neither. The Scripture says that Joseph was a just man. He was a righteous man. And because Joseph was a just man, he handled this situation as gracefully as he possibly could have. As a righteous man, Joseph knew that the law required adulterers to be put to death. Yet as righteousness is ever directed by mercy... He does not publicly expose her and turn her over to be punished. After all, if she was guilty of sin, she had not sinned, she, she had not sinned against anybody else. She just sinned against him. And therefore, he had the right to pass by this offense if he so desired. Now, of course, bear in mind, Mary had not sinned. I'm just, uh, you know contemplating what could have been going through Joseph's mind. She had not sinned. God had chosen her uh, out of all the young virgins in Israel to bear the Son of God in her womb. She had not sinned. She had not been with another man. She had done nothing but passively accept what God was going to use her for. And she did it knowing that she might be accused of sin by those who did not believe her. She was in obedience to God. She had not sinned, though Joseph for a time thought otherwise. And so, and though Joseph finds himself in such a great dilemma, uh, because Joseph was a just man, he finds a third way. He neither pretends they committed fornication, sacrificing his own integrity, nor does he publicly disgrace her. He decides he will put her away privately. He decides he will do what he has to do to preserve his integrity, all the while being as merciful to Mary as possible. This is Joseph going a third way. And many times, God presents us with a third way that did not occur to us at first. Joseph could have easily taken advantage of the law and had Mary stoned to death, but he chose mercy over what he thought would have been justice. And though God's plan in this particular situation was going to be that he was to stay with her, before he changed his mind about putting her away, he was still bearing the fruit of the Spirit in the way he was dealing with this matter, planning to put an end to this betrothal privately so as to protect her. In his eyes, she'd fallen into sin. There was no need to drag her through the mud. God forgives. And so Joseph also had a heart of forgiveness. He would simply do what had to be done and leave her be. And since at that time, as we know from the kinds of questions that the Pharisees were asking Jesus during his ministry, uh, many in Israel in that day thought it was lawful to put away their wife for any cause. And so Mary, uh, Joseph was most likely prepared to put her away without giving a reason so that her life would be spared. But of course, as we read here in the Gospel of Matthew, just as Joseph was to prepared to put Mary away privately, the angel of the Lord comes to him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This child in Mary's womb is not to be the Ill illegitimate child Joseph had once thought, but was a child conceived by the power 
of the Holy Spirit. And, and not only is this child a, a child conceived of the Holy Spirit, but he is going to be the one who is going to save his people from their sins. Joseph was to name the child Jesus, and that was a fairly common name at that time. Uh, it was a Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means the Lord is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. But this child was not going to simply bear this name. He was going to fulfill the meaning of this name in what he was going to do. He is the Lord. He is Jehovah. And He will save His people from their sins. Now this was to be the fulfillment, as Matthew tells us. This was to be the fulfillment of the prophecy we find in Isaiah 7, 14. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, as the prophet said. A virgin is to conceive... A son. This son is to be Emmanuel or God with us. And Joseph was not to put Mary away, but instead marry her and raise the holy child up as his own. And this son that he is going to raise is going to be God with us. Now Joseph was to call this son Jesus. As the angel said to him, you shall call his name Jesus. But the people, the people were going to call him Emmanuel, as Matthew writes, and they, sh and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew tells us that the coming of Emmanuel is the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah. But what does Isaiah mean by Emmanuel? We know what, that Emmanuel means God with us because Matthew tells us that that's what it means. But what does God with us mean? Emmanuel is to be given the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And how will Emmanuel save his people from their sins? And so first I want to answer the question, what does Emmanuel mean? And then I want to answer the question, how is Emmanuel going to save his people from their sins? So let us look, first look at what does Emmanuel or God with us mean. The, prophet, uh, the prophecy in Isaiah about the virgin birth was given at a time in which Judah was in danger of being taken over by Syria. Syria was confederate with Ephraim. Syria and Ephraim had been plotting against Judah to attack it and to take it over. But God came to Isaiah and told him that this was not going to come to pass. The Lord said to Ahaz, who was king of Judah at that time, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. But Ahaz refused. And because Ahaz refused to ask, the Lord himself gives the sign. And the sign is to be that a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel. So it's clear that the sign is a virgin birth. That a virgin is going to give birth to a son, which implies that a miraculous work of God must take place. And this son which shall be born is going to be God with us. But what kind of comfort is this to Ahaz when he has armies coming out to make war with Judah, seeking to conquer it and set up a new king in his place? Well, since this sign is yet to take place... It reveals that Judah is going to be preserved, at least until this miraculous virgin birth takes place. And here in Matthew's Gospel, we read of the fulfillment of that sign which was made to Judah those years ago. Judah was preserved against all odds, so that out of it, Emmanuel would come. We could even say that God preserved Judah for the very purpose that one day, out of it, Emmanuel would come. Now looking further into the words of the prophet Isaiah, where he gives his prophecy on the virgin birth, he reveals more about what Emmanuel means. You know, Matthew gets the name Emmanuel from the prophet Isaiah. He defines it for us as being God with us. And being with someone means that they're present with you. 
The Hebrew indicates that Emmanuel fully means the strong God with us. But what kind of information is given to us that we can know what kind of presence Isaiah is talking about when he says God is going to be with us? If God is going to be with His people, then that means they are going to be in His presence. What kind of presence is Isaiah speaking of? Well, God can be with us spiritually. We know that He indwells the hearts of His people spiritually. We know He does mighty works by His Spirit. And we can say that God's spiritual presence truly is God's presence. We can even say that if God was only with us spiritually, that that is God's presence. But Isaiah tells us that what he means by God with us is that he will be dwelling with us in the flesh. He will be made flesh and he will remain flesh. And he reveals this by telling us that this child born of a virgin will eat curds and honey. He says curds and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. He is to remain with us spiritually, but He is to now be with us physically as a man who eats food. Those whom Jesus was with during His earthly ministry, He was with both spiritually and physically in human flesh. And of course, we, though we only experience Christ spiritually at this current moment... There will come a day when we are able to experience Jesus in the flesh too. For He did not lose His flesh after His death on the cross. He rose from the dead in His glorified human body. He ascended to heaven in that body. He sits at the right hand of God in that body. And He will come again in that body. He will eternally be God in the flesh, existing forever as one Christ with two natures, divine and human. And of course, though John does not use the term Emmanuel in his gospel, he presents the concept that we're talking about. John uses the wording, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. God has made flesh, and He's made flesh in order that, we may, that He may dwell among us. He, he comes to us through Mary by entering into her womb by, the Hol by Holy Ghost conception and being born as a baby. And He enters this life. He enters life in this world the same way we all do. He is going to be born into Adam's race without Adam's guilt. And though He inherits no sin nature because He's God born of a virgin... He still takes on a full humanity. We touched on that a little bit last week with the genealogy. He is flesh and bone. He is, as He calls Himself many times, the Son of Man. He is a son of Adam without inheriting Adam's sin. Luke's genealogy makes sure that we, we see that He traces Christ's lineage all the way back to Adam. He is not going to dwell among us in the way He did when His glory came down and abode in the tabernacle, which only priests were able to approach unto. But He is going to dwell amongst us in such a way that we will be able to behold His glory. All of us. All of His people. He is going to dwell with us in such a way that people are going to be able to reach out and to touch Him. And He likewise will be able to reach out and touch them. He's going to heal both by touching people and, he, and He's going to heal by people reaching out and touching Him. He is going to be able to tell His disciples things like this. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. He, he, he's going to be able to say uh, things like he said to doubting Thomas when he said, Here, reach here your finger. Behold my hands and reach here your hand. And thrust it into my side. 
And be not faithless, but believing. And so we can see, we can kind of get a sense of what Emmanuel, God with us, means. That God is not only going to be with us spiritually, but He is going to be with us physically in the person of Christ, the God-man. But how is Emmanuel going to save his people from their sins? The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 that it was by one man that sin entered into the world. By one man's offense, death uh, reigned from Adam to Moses. And, and it's still reigning over mankind today. By the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. So by the righteousness of one, the free gift of justification unto life has come. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. One man, Adam, brought the guilt of sin upon the human race. And one God-man, Jesus Christ, brings salvation to sinners. Not only canceling the curse of sin over us by dying on the cross for us, suffering the penalty our sin deserves in our place, but He also brings salvation by living righteously as the God-man on our behalf so that we not only have our guilt removed by His sacrifice, but His righteousness is given to us. But in order to accomplish all of this, the Son of God becomes flesh. He is born of a virgin to dwell amongst us. He had to become Emmanuel, God with us. In order to redeem children of Adam, Christ becomes the last Adam to live as the perfect man die as the perfect man, thus making himself the perfect Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. This takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden when God told the serpent that he would bruise his head through the seed of the woman. Though this is not without the serpent's bruising of the heel of the seed of the woman first, even back at the very beginning of the fall of man, God was planning to use the seed of the woman to overcome the serpent's power over the children of Adam. But this was going to be done by allowing the seed of the woman to be bruised, even unto death, and then rise to life again. He was to be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was to be upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. Christ is the prophesied seed of the woman who bruised the serpent's head. On the cross, Christ makes a full and forever sufficient atonement for sin. He absorbs the wrath of God upon Himself. He dies our death. And He's raised up again from the dead, victorious over the last enemy, death. And now, all, all who look to Christ by faith and repent of their sins are able to partake of the benefits of such a victory. It reminds me of the hymn by H.J. Gauntlet, Jesus Lives Thy Terrors Now. He said in the hymn, Jesus Lives Thy Terrors Now. Can no longer death appall us. Jesus lives, by this we know. Thou, O grave, canst not enthrall us. Jesus lives, henceforth is death, but the gate of life immortal. This shall calm our trembling breath when we pass its gloomy portal. As the last Adam, Christ becomes a new federal head of people from the human race. He becomes the federal head of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people 
who are called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. And as Adam is the federal head of all mankind, making us all sinners in him, so Christ becomes the federal head of God's elect, so that everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is translated from under Adam's headship, which leads to condemnation, to under Christ's headship, escaping the curse of sin and death and inheriting eternal life. Those of us who are in Christ, we are no longer considered to be in Adam, since, as Paul says, in Adam all die. To be made alive in Christ is to cease to be a spiritual child of Adam, though we still remain physical descendants of Adam, even after being born again. But under Jesus, we are under a new federal head. Our Lord was never a spiritual child of Adam, which is why He qualified to be our Redeemer. Christ was never a spiritual child of Adam. But He is Emmanuel. And as Emmanuel, He becomes a physical descendant of Adam to save His people, not in their sins, but from their sins, just as Matthew says. He came to save us not only from hell's flames and the consequences of sin, but sin's dominion over the human heart. And so we've answered the question of the meaning of Emmanuel, or God with us. We have answered the question, how will Emmanuel save his people from their sins? And now let us go briefly back to Joseph, since he's in view as this chapter comes to a close. Joseph was going to put Mary away to save, it, save her reputation and perhaps her life. He's going to put her away privately. But the angel of the Lord comes to him in a dream and tells him she has done no wrong. The angel tells him, take Mary as your wife. This child which is in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus. Now Luke's gospel tells us that they took the Lord eight days after he was born just as God required of newborn males. And Joseph had him circumcised. And it was at the circumcision that they officially bestowed upon him the name of Jesus. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse number 21, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The name Jesus was given by the command of God and was given to Christ when he was eight days old at his circumcision. And on the same day in which Christ was given his name, Jesus, the Lord is salvation. The knife of circumcision began to shed the blood without which there is no remission of sins. Mary is also mentioned in the last verse as the inspired writer wants us to make sure that we emphasize that Joseph did not know Mary. That, it, that is, know her in the carnal sense. He did not know her until after she gave birth to Jesus. It says he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he... Joseph called his name Jesus. Now, Roman Catholics have made the assumption that Mary remained a virgin even after she gave birth to Christ, and they've made a doctrine out of it. But the Scriptures lead us to believe that her virginity lasted only until she gave birth to Christ, as the wording reveals, and knew her not, he, Joseph, knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Now, it could be argued that there are places in Scripture where uh, firstborn is used to refer to an early, only child. But other than that, we have the wording, knew her not until. Which seems to imply that Joseph came to know her after. 
Nevertheless, whether Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life or whether she came to know her husband after the birth of Christ, it doesn't change anything. What matters is her virginity before the birth of Christ. Her virginity before the birth of Christ is an article of our faith in which many other essential doctrines rise or fall. But those who advocate for her perpetual virginity, they've much wasted their time. The important thing is, is that Mary was used by the Lord to fulfill the promise, the sign which he gave Judah in the days of the prophet Isaiah. A virgin conceived, she bore a son, and he was called Emmanuel. God with us means that we have God's presence. It means that he is present with us. After his bodily resurrection, Christ ascended to, to sit at the right hand of the Father. He, 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 and he remains there to this very day until he comes again. We, we say that in the Apostles' Creed. And though Christ's body is in heaven at this present moment, and he's not able to be with us yet in the physical way in which he was with his disciples, he still dwells in his people by his Spirit. The Nicene Creed tells us that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and He proceeds from the Son. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that if we are children of God, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, which spirit he wrote to the Romans, bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. The Apostle John tells us that he that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. And to add an interesting story to this, John Wesley's father, uh, Samuel Wesley, when he was on his deathbed, one of his last words to his son was this. The inward witness, son. The inward witness. This is the strongest proof of Christianity. And of course, by the inward witness, Samuel Wesley meant the presence of Christ within you. The presence of Christ within you. If God is with us, that means His presence is with us. Is Jesus Christ Emmanuel to you? Is God's presence with you in your life? Does the Spirit of the crucified and risen Christ live within you? May none of us find rest until we are sure of this. And if you're not sure of this, may you keep reaching out to Jesus until you can say along with our beloved Apostle, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The Lord calls us to come out of this world, be separate, to repent and to turn away from our sins and to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. By obeying the gospel, we become temples of the living God. By the operation of the Holy Spirit within our hearts, we become dwelling places fit for the risen Christ to reside. And if you have had this transforming work of the Spirit in your heart, and Christ is living in you, you are a temple of God. And if we are temples of the living God, we have this promise from God that He, this new covenant promise, that He will dwell in us and walk in us. And He will be our God. And we 
shall be His people. Let us rest in that promise. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the Lord Jesus Christ who was manifested in the flesh for us. God with us, Emmanuel, to relate to us, to live amongst us, but to also live the perfect life and die on the cross to make an atonement for us and to rise again. All of this was accomplished for our redemption, but ultimately for your glory. And so for that we give you praise for Emmanuel. And we look with earnest expectation as the Jews of old looked with earnest expectation to the first advent where Christ would come in the flesh. We look with earnest expectation to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when He will come with clouds descending. We thank You for Your mercy in Christ. And we thank You that You're able to look upon us through the blood of Christ. May we walk in the Spirit. And may You fill us with Your presence, O Lord, as we wait for the day in which we're able to walk with Jesus and touch Him. May You fill us with His Spirit that we may be close to Him now. And we, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.